Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer at IT Pro TV. And with me today is Cameron Guerra, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me, Cam. Thanks for having me, Taylor. It's been a little, been a little bit. Yeah, it's been a little bit. We're happy to have you back on the podcast. Appreciate that. So today we are going to be talking about Haskell, of course, but more specifically refactoring and types. But what's the article we're, we're going to be covering, Cam? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's an article by Tom Ellis. Um, so it's called Good Design and Type Safety in, Yat- in Yahtzee, which is um, actually a, a article looking at another article and improving some code and, and doing some refactoring, which is a really, really informational. Um, so I'm really excited about today. Me too. Because this, like you mentioned, is kind of a response article to another one where mm-hmm. somebody had some code that they'd written and they slapped some types on it and were complaining that it um, kind of made things harder to read and didn't give them too much type safety. Right, yeah. The words they used were unreadable and unmaintainable. <laughs> which Bad words. I, I get, looking at the code, it was pretty hard to read. Yeah. And I was like, like, there has to be a better way. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. And I think we're going to talk about the various steps um, that Tom took to kind of say, hey, like, type type safety isn't something you just throw on. It's something that you design with. And, right. you know, when you have good design, you know, type safety is just there and it allows you to really feel confident about the code you're writing. Exactly. So instead of taking some piece of code and throwing types on it, you kind of develop the types and the design in lockstep. Right. One influences the other. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, which I think was cool. Um, yeah, because, yeah, there's a quote. He said, he, you know, oh, I don't think I'm going to quote it exactly, but, um, you know, he talks about building type safety, stru- type safe structures and combinators relevant um, to the domain. And then that's what we use with the implementation. Right. Yeah, so um, this is going to be a little interesting to talk about because obviously we're talking about a piece of code, um, and it's really hard to communicate code over voice. Right. But, you know, think about the game of Yahtzee. Mm-hmm. That's what we're talking about. So the game of Yahtzee, you have five dice. You roll them. You have, I believe, tends to be three rolls. Um, and you can, you know, it's a dice. So it's one to six. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so what we're going to kind of do is uh, understand what the rolls are. I guess that's that's the name of it. It's called all roles as the function we're going to kind of be evaluating. Right. Yeah. So the the original function by Mark Dominus, the blog post he wrote about it, mm-hmm. it um, has some role, presumably from a game of Yahtzee, and it is given some choices like re-roll that die, keep that one, and then figure out what the next result's going to be. Mm-hmm. So that's the that's the game plan here. And as Cam mentioned, this kind of starts off as something that. Um, the, the quote-unquote not type-safe version is kind of understandable, but a little dense. And then the quote-unquote type-safe version is just completely impenetrable because there's so many, like, wrapping, unwrapping things going on. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the type safety doesn't, you know, doesn't just get slapped on, like we said earlier. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited um, to kind of dive, dive in. So let's do that. Let's dive right in. And, uh get started here. So um, we start with the original implementation, just kind of repeated in full. Mm -hmm. Um, And from a high level, what we're doing is applying a bunch of very small refactorings to this piece of code. um, On an iterative basis. Yeah, iteratively. So at each step, we don't need to know too much, if anything, about what the original code is doing. We're just saying, I recognize this pattern as something that... uh, could use a little more type safety, so let's nudge it in that direction. Right, and and as somebody who's been in Haskell for a year now, like some of these suggestions that we're going to talk about are are now relevant. But starting out, I would have been very like, wait, what? You can do that? <laughs> um, so you know, if you're a beginner, like this is something you kind of learn with time, and you know, this article could be a good help for, for you to understand and see, you know, not necessarily what the code is doing, but the patterns in which it's implementing and being able to pull it out, you know, the common, you know, um, best practices of Haskell. Right. Um, yeah. It's kind of like a, a quick tour of some, 
kind of design patterns that mm -hmm. you might use in Haskell for refactoring. And I've also heard people describe this as a intermediate level Haskell post where there's a lot of the kind of beginner stuff of like, here's a monad, here's how to do addition, you know, real rudimentary things. Right. And then there's all the super advanced, you know, type level shenanigans stuff. And this one's right in the middle of like actual work a day, just how do you make software better? Right. Yeah. Which I, I'm a fan of because, you know, as a day to day engineer, this is stuff you use. Uh, yeah. Like we're not designing this giant, you know, data parser that needs to be perfect but we're also not you know just making a simple api that say hey i'm here you know like yeah. there's nothing so we're in the middle and this is what kind of you know plays into it so mm -hmm. um I, I think we should jump right in um you know the first thing he notices um and this is something we do more in intermediate steps but is the use of undefined yeah. so that means there's a case that we aren't accounting for there's something like that's the case we don't expect to get to because you hit that on a find in runtime and you're blowing up right you now and you're blowing up with a really useless error message message right. that just says undefined happened somewhere good luck figuring it out peace <laughs> yeah so how do they improve the situation right so um he says you know all right we ha we have this undefined that's a red flag let's throw a useful error that's mm -hmm. what he does first he says all right we're gonna you know call the error function with a string that says you hit this lo location and their you know choices has to be the same length as the vowels or values that um, you're working in so right. so after this change if you do run into that case if something went wrong you now have a breadcrumb to go look for and say right. okay well i can track things down a little bit yeah and then the other thing he does is you know to kind of set himself up well for success is he avoids um you know catch-all patterns right? right like because a catch-all you know there's a chance you're missing something. There's some invariant that you don't know about because you're like, eh, anything happens here, you know, we're going to fail. Right. Um, yeah. Is, so if you're pattern matching on like the empty list and then mm -hmm. you're pattern matching, pattern matching on the list, having exactly one element and then like a catch all, mm -hmm. you could think, oh, well the catch all is for when there's three or more elements, but really you're missing the case where there's exactly two. And it's, you know, GHC is not going to warn you about that because you're mm. explicitly handling, quote unquote, every case with that catch all, but it may not be working the way you expect. Right. So, you know, he, he kind of, uh, you know, that's another, the next step after, you know, throwing the areas. Oh, hey, like, let's not use catch all. Right. He uses catch all internally, but he destructures yeah, the he element he's working in. Right. And, you know, with the warn all, which, or warn everything, or you know, all the Haskell, you know, compiler warnings. He kind of turns on. He's able to find that there's another invariant mm -hmm. in there. Um, yeah. So he he keeps um, strengthening the invariant or finding more. Right. Where he's like, okay, previously we just had one case here, but really there were two cases kind of hiding behind this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think down the road, that's something for like for me, like as a intermediate, you know, mid level uh, Haskell developer, is like understanding that catch alls aren't always the best solution and to maybe try to put out every case and mm -hmm. see if there's something that you know you can bubble up to the type system that would allow you not to have to even care about these invariant cases right um which is kind of what he's doing here um which is really really for me informational um and i would recommend anybody to read this article because i felt like i was like oh okay i i don't have to just use a catch-all because it's you know what I know to do, mm -hmm. I can write out each case and kind Every of case. understand and see where, you know, the logic error could, mm -hmm. you know, or the invariant could live and maybe bubble that up to the type system, like I said. Yeah. And even though we're talking about uh, kind of removing catch all cases here as a refactoring step, sometimes it can be useful to still use them. And especially if uh, you have a bunch of them and you write them all out, all, excuse me, you write all of them out explicitly. Mm hmm. You may see like, oh, these I have twenty cases here, and nineteen of them are the same. I'll go ahead and replace those with a catch-all. Right, that's but at least you've done that legwork to say, well, I looked at all the cases. Right, you're understanding the code in which you're writing, mm -hmm. and that's you know part of refactoring. Like, yes, there's things you can do in Haskell that you don't have to fully understand what the code's doing to refactor, uh, but if you want to understand the code, you want to make it a useful refactor. It tends to be better to to take the extra step. Yeah, um, which I think is really cool. Um, and I think, you know, we can all kind of glean that, you know, some information from that process. Mm -hmm. So moving on from the catch all patterns, uh, this next refactoring, I feel like is a really big one. And mm -hmm. the key thing that it does here that I see is that 
they recognize a function is doing two things and they pull them out into two functions. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, you know, a function doing multiple things is always the clearest choice. Mm -hmm. Especially for pure functions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very common for some effectful function to do a lot of stuff, like right, log handler. out, talk to the database, you know, it, it's stitching a bunch of other things together. Right, right, right. But pure functions, yeah, there's no reason to do that. Mm -hmm. And as we'll see later on, it can often really clarify things to have two very tiny functions that do mm -hmm. separate things and then you combine them into one top level function that does everything right yeah make definitely makes refactoring easy so yeah this function he pulls out is great because it kind of uh checks for the invariant it says i'm gonna pull that logic out and you know if i find this invariant i'll throw up my error mm -hmm. if not then i'll just return the values that you know the function the the function i extracted from expects right um and then it also clears up the uh, the main function that we were using and yeah. it says oh hey we just have a you know in this case it's a maybe you know okay we just have a case that says is you know is it just or is it nothing mm -hmm. um and the error is handled within the separate function yeah it kind of quarantines those invariant checks into one function mm -hmm. so that outside of there you can generally just say okay i'm assuming those have been handled um, mm -hmm. which is really nice. And as you mentioned, it also cleans up reading that top level function that calls the other one because you don't have to, when you're reading it, you don't have to worry about the logic there. You can say, okay, that other function handles it. I can read that if I'm interested, but mm -hmm. when I'm here, I just have to pattern match on that. Maybe. Right. Yeah. And which, uh, yeah, I think that's something we as an engineering team have gotten better at is understanding like, okay, like we don't have to do everything in this one pure function. We should break it out make make it smaller make it easier to understand um, right and kind of keep keep bite-sized pieces rather than a whole sub or something you know yeah it it's almost never a bad idea sometimes you can go crazy and have way too many small functions right but uh, i think it's usually pretty obvious when that when that happens especially when you're trying to read through one function and you have to keep bouncing around to other definitions it makes it hard to read bounce chicken wow wow um cool well we're gonna move on go to the next one um the next one is a little bit trickier because you have to think through the um, design process and kind of have a better understanding of what your code is doing. Um, so this is, you know, kind of that next step. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of finding that a value is unused. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're looking at a function, especially a recursive function, uh, and you see a value that doesn't end up being in the final result, that should kind of stir your stomach and kind of feel like something's wrong. And for us, I'm sure there's lots of spots in our code where we're like, eh, we don't need this. But, you know, having senior engineers like you and Cody allows us to think through those things and see them and identify them faster. Um, so with time, you get better at that. But, you know, Tom here is like, hey, like there's this value we're kind of using. And at the end of the day, we don't ever display it or return it. It's just to keep track of something in a recursive function. Mm -hmm. Um and so he does a lot, you know, he kind of says, hey, let's take some time and think about why we're returning this value. And he kind of puts in like a, a test, like, hey, if we hit this value, this, what we expect to be here, then we should throw an error because we actually don't expect to be here. Like it's not a final value. Right. And in a way, this is another type of invariant. And the invariant is we're not using this value. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also important to point out here that we're talking about refactoring and using type systems, but really in this case, uh, you're relying on the test suite because he's saying, I looked at this value and I don't think it's used. So I'm going to plug in an error there and mm -hmm. then rerun my tests and see that that error doesn't get thrown. So yeah, that value is not used. Right. So a lot of people think that you have to kind of use types or use tests, but really you use both and right. they both help. Right. And that's kind of his whole scheme you know yeah. uh, point in this article is like it's not one or the other it's together right um, it's a symbiotic relationship um which i think is cool uh and so yeah he kind of indicates okay this is unused and then he kind of takes a you know a step to say oh wait like we're kind of having these different types that are you know they don't need to be bound together they're not you know something that relies on one another mm -hmm. so uh, he has a tuple here that he's like i, I don't feel like this type's actually used so he kind of gets rid of the type alias and says okay like let's just name it and let's see and take some steps and see if we can get these to be independent right um, very you know independent arguments and then if those arguments 
don't get used, we can factor them out a little bit better. Right. Because it's a lot easier to get rid of one argument than it is to get rid of half of a tuple. Right. Mm, half a tuple. <laughs> a one pull. A one pull. <laughs> AKA just parens. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he kind of takes a couple steps to rearrange um, some stuff. So yeah. I no, I'm and gonna... I think it's interesting the way that he does this because he recognizes that these two values that are in a tuple together probably shouldn't be together. Mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't immediately delete one of them. He kind of pries them apart and then um, makes it easier for himself to delete that single argument later on. Mm -hmm. And I really like that because uh, he identifies the refactoring that he wants to do of getting rid of this member of the tuple. And then he does like a intermediate refactoring that makes that thing he wants to do later a lot easier. So that instead of getting rid of one thing out of a tuple, he can get rid of an uh, an argument to a function, which, as you said, is a little easier to manage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, I think like error messages associated with that stuff tends to be easier too, rather than like, oh, wait, we have a tuple. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just think it's all around a better choice, you know, and, and if, if there are two arguments that are very closely tied, like, yeah, a tuple is understandable and he kind of gets back to that at some point yeah uh, but he says like hey like let's let's figure out where the real connection is here right he's not saying that a tuple is the wrong data structure he's saying it doesn't look right right now right here so mm -hmm. let's pry it apart right so i think that's good and i think you know for you know mark and as he wrote that you know the all roles the function yeah the original author like you know he's still learning he's kind of figuring it out he's you know saying hey like this tuple seems like the right move and and that is as software engineers that's our that's what happens that's our job we say mm -hmm. oh this works we get it functional we make it work we make it you know do what we expect it to and then you know we can come back and refactor so i think this is very informational it's like you know it worked it's a, a good it's an okay solution mm -hmm. but you can kind of look at it and say oh let's let's bring it to something better yeah and and case in point the refactoring here isn't let's slap some types on it on the arguments after the fact it's okay let's take that function and really break it down step by step and find mm -hmm. the better ways to do those things yeah so i think that's cool um and as he um rearranges arguments he actually puts something back into a tuple mm -hmm. that he's passing to this that helper function we created earlier that pure invariant function right um and he's you know he made it a tuple and then he realized oh we pass that tuple to this function we we deconstruct it but we don't really need to deconstruct it yeah because we're just passing it to a function and that function returns a, a value that we can you know deconstruct individually rather than having you know this confusing decoupling in the the type that it's not type declaration but function the, declaration yeah the function declaration so instead of matching on this tuple and grabbing the left and the right value out of it and then later on building that exact same tuple again you can not destructure it and pass that original tuple straight through mm -hmm. yeah which is a nice nice add mm -hmm. um you know there's nothing wrong with destructuring the tuple but it makes but, it harder to read like you right. said it can be hard because you when you read that you think okay i'm going to be using each piece of this individually but really you're not you're just building that thing again later right now if you, if you layer you're trying to use that value one of those values from it that makes sense yeah but if it's only being passed to another function there's no reason to do mm -hmm. that the next one is, i think is the big one is the big <laughs> kahuna if you know what i mean uh and this one is something that you know you you probably need to know and understand what the code is doing yeah. to do effectively. Yeah, and I backing up a little bit, all the things we've talked about so far, you don't really need to understand what the code's doing. You right. can just look at it and say, oh, I recognize that's kind of a weird pattern. Let's do it this other way instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, the the big idea here, and he kind of says it in a summary, is like, you know, this refactor, Haskell's gonna hold your hand through it. You know, like, mm -hmm. you can do this kind of refactor in any language. It doesn't like there's always a way to refactor. The nice thing about Haskell is it's gonna hold your hand through. Yeah, it. it helps you along the way. Right. So this next big one is this idea of like that unused value that we kind of talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That's not really needed in the core of the function. Um, is is we're getting rid of this. We're we're making a structural change and design decision that allows like the confidence that the type is doing what we you know 
or the function and the types are doing what we expect them to do. Yeah. The type so we, systems help. We us. added that invariant that said we're not using this argument. Mm -hmm. And now we're finally getting rid of that argument. So mm -hmm. we're like um, taking this information that we had only in our head and pushing it into the type signature of this function so that it doesn't need that argument anymore. Right. You know, and pushing out some of the, you know, doing, doing a, making it pure and pushing out like the core logic into a separate function and allowing the original function just to say, Hey, I know I keep track of this integer because I need to know where I am recursively, mm -hmm. but it doesn't require that, you know, you know, if I have an empty list of choices that, okay, I do nothing. And if you know, we have something, then, okay, let's, we don't really care about what that value is. We just need to do an action. Right. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. So that's one of the big refactorings. And I feel like we're maybe not doing it justice over audio, but mm -hmm. um, they then follow up with another really huge one, which I think is the the main um, kind of uh, rallying cry of type systems, which mm -hmm. is making illegal states unrepresentable. So they say like, okay, we've done all these little refactorings to kind of clean it up and make it easier to understand. But now let's do one that actually eliminates some of these invariants that we have and pushes them into the type system. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The big kahuna. Yep. The other big kahuna. There's two of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, that's kind of what he's saying is like, Hey, there's little things you can do, but there's also bigger things you can do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's very informational and yeah, I think, you know, kind of, this is the moment where you say, okay, these two things are so closely tied together that they shouldn't be separated and there mm -hmm. should be a, uh, you know, the way to make, you know, the type system make illegal states irrepresentable, not representable. Yeah. I don't, words are hard. They are. Anywho, you know, we're kind of talking here, but uh, <laughs> we're trying, trying yeah. our best. And uh, this step actually reminds me of a blog post a while ago by Matt Parsons um, called type safety back and forth, mm -hmm. where he mentions that you can have functions that, um, you know, return a maybe or return an either or something like that. Uh, or you can have a function where the input to that function represents that invariant that you're, that you were enforcing by the output. So I feel like that's what's kind of happening here. We had a function that returned a maybe, uh, because it was kind of like connecting these two lists together. Mm -hmm. And what we did instead was pushed that connection out of the function and said, okay, I take a tuple where the things have already been connected and then I don't have to return a maybe any anymore. I can always return something. Right. So in this particular instance, they pushed it out to a zip at the top level mm -hmm. that says, okay, combine these two things. Right. And you know, it, it, it didn't fully get rid of our maybe, but it got it, us closer. It got us closer, right? It, it allowed us to see, which he kind of talks about next is, you know, okay, we can use on cons, which the yeah. next very step after that is don't use on cons and just use <laughs> pattern matching. But that's the thing is you take baby steps. Exactly. You know, okay. This, I see this is on cons. Okay. Well, okay. I don't quite need on cons here. I can just pattern match yeah. and it's just steps. You don't need to go steps. zero to a hundred in one step. And Hundo? this is another upshot of doing really small functions. Like we talked about earlier is that sometimes you'll have one of those small functions and you'll see, Oh, this is just some other function that I already knew, but I didn't realize it when I was using it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, because often, especially in Haskell with really polymorphic types, you can have something that's really concrete. And then when you actually write it out, you say, Oh, this is just traverse or map M or something like that. Right. Which you'll see later. Yeah. <laughs> He's foreshadowing your guys. Um, all right. So the next one for me is something that's beyond helpful and it's the do not using do notation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have the bind operator in Haskell and that's great. And if you can make the bind operator look understandable, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a fan, but the fact that 95% of the time, in my opinion, do notation is much clearer. Yeah. And yeah, I know it de sugars to the bind operator underneath the covers, but it, it visually and understandability wise, it doesn't help. And mm -hmm. so that maybe that's part of the reason why, you know, Mark said, Oh, this is untainable and unreadable. Like this bind operator right here is not helpful. Right. Yeah. It's got a bind right in the middle of like the core business logic mm -hmm. of, that this thing is doing. So you have to understand not only all of the Yahtzee rules, but also this weird Haskell operator and how it works. Right. Which and, direction is it going? What's, you know, obviously the type system can help you with that, but yeah. And I'm with you a hundred percent. I feel like if you can use do notation, you probably should, even if it feels a little silly, if you're only like pulling one value out or something, it just, mm 
it's so much more familiar to a lot of programmers. Right, because it's a step-by-step process. Like, okay, right. do this, I've then gotten do this. this value. Now I can use that value here and mm-hmm. this. And oh. even in cases like this where we're using do notation with a list data type, mm-hmm. so we can think of it kind of sequentially, like grab this value, then grab this value. But really the list data type is representing choice for us. So it's saying, well, choose a value here and then choose another value and then combine them in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that's the that's the value add of monads is that you can choose a different representation. And in this one, we're using lists to represent doing different stuff, but we still use do notation. So that's right. nice. Good old list monad. Helpful. Yep. Um, cool. Well, the next step is something that I think as this refactor happened, it became apparently clear is right. we are taking you know so, uh, the head of a list, modifying that value and then sticking it back onto the, the list. Right. You know, and, and in anybody's mind who's been around Haskell and functional programming, you know, whether that's that, even yeah. in, uh, no, no matter what the language is, Oh, I'm just mapping over, a list and doing some operation on each value. Mm-hmm. That's a map. And so <laughs> he's like, hey, and you know, we're in the list monad, so let's use map M. Right. Because the action we're taking for each element is monadic. But um, yeah, this is this is a great example of these really small steps paying off because you're looking at this and you're saying, you know what, this is just a map. Let's call mm-hmm. it a map. And uh, that way, whoever reads it next doesn't have to understand like the manual recursion that's going on or whatever it is they're like oh map i know how that works Mm -hmm. yeah no and i I think that was a big a big boost i Mm -hmm. mean it literally took it from five you know seven lines to two right it really crunches it down right and and it's not any less clear right Right. well i'd argue it's more clear right even though it's shorter right because you don't have to worry about oh this case and what's going on like Mm -hmm. it's all kind of taken care of yeah, um, which I think is really cool. And then finally, we get to the last refactor, which is one we've done a, an entire podcast on. So exactly. If you're go more to that one. yeah, if you're interested in it, go check it out. But avoiding bullying blindness. Mm-hmm. I think last week, uh, one of our teammates had like this question of like, "Oh, we should just use a boolean here," and we're like, we're all like, "Wait, no, <laughs> let's let's think about this. Like, is this a value we rely on, mm-hmm. or is it just a value we're returning?" And you know, if you're just returning the boolean, okay, that's fine. Yeah. But if you're trying to use that in an operation, it's, yeah, it's not clear. Right. So in this particular example, we have a tuple with a Boolean in it and some integer. And if I just describe that to you, you don't actually know what that means. But what we refactor it into is a data type that says, re-roll this die or keep this role that we already had and its value was this integer. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously the data type constructors are much shorter than what I've just said, right. but they communicate that intent much better than a tuple with these two things in it right yeah it's like oh what am i doing with this boolean yeah oh i'm I'm either re-rolling or i'm keeping it you know because it's this data type and you know you can create a a simple function that turns that data type into the boolean result you want right or you can pattern match on it right so then it uh reads a lot better when you're reading through the code you don't have to say if you know, this Boolean part of this tuple is true, then do this, blah, blah, blah. You can say, oh, if we're re-rolling, do this, or if we're keeping it, do that. Right. Yeah. Boolean blindness. So much mm, nicer to not be it. blind. Yeah. I love seeing. Yeah, no. Um, I know. I know we've talked about this internally as a team is, um, you know, using Lambda case. Mm-hmm. Like, it's cool. I was like, I guess, he, you know, he uses Lambda case, which is, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's nice. I just also, like, the, the normal case statement in my mind is... It's not that much worse. Right. <laughs> like, I'm not... So, yeah, I know you're going to, you know, it were uncontroversial. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a pretty common uh, language extension. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do feel like it kind of undercuts his argument here where, you know, Haskell has a reputation of needing all of these language extensions to do anything. And I'm happy that he shows one here because it, it does make it look nicer. Mm-hmm. But... I feel like he could have just as easily written out the Lambda explicitly and said, well, this is kind of, you know, maybe not super nice. And if you want to avoid it, use Lambda case. But really, every other programming language is pretty comfortable using Lambdas. You know, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, whatever. You would just write the Lambda and nobody would think twice about it. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. And now we've arrived at the end. We have this perfect refactored all roles function and Mm -hmm. we can now play Yahtzee and Haskell. 
Oh, yeah. And we can understand what we wrote. Which yeah. It's helpful. You That's know, the goal. Come back later. We're like, oh, okay, yeah. We know what this is doing rather than uh, there's something going on here. Not mm-hmm. quite sure. Um, so, I mean, I would definitely agree with, with Mark's like feelings of it being un- his original work being unreadable and unmaintainable. But I think, you know, Tom says, hey, like, I, I, you, I get that. And Haskell can be unreadable and unmaintainable. But if you focus on not just type safety, but good design and type safety, right. you can create a beautiful work of art. And, you know, yeah. And when Haskell. you have those two things complementing each other, where mm-hmm. you use the types to influence your design and your design influences your types as well. That's the, the sweet spot to be in. Oh, so sweet. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a great article by Tom. I would definitely encourage all of our listeners to go check it out. Um, it's a little hefty, but it's a good intermediate post. Yeah. And it really teaches you or shows you rather these refactoring strategies you can mm-hmm. use in Haskell or really, as he mentions, any language. Right. But the reason that he focuses on Haskell here is A, because he knows it, I imagine. But B, um, it really pushes you in the right direction with mm-hmm. a lot of these decisions. It makes them easy. Right. Yeah. It definitely nudges us away. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that's pretty awesome. But uh, yeah, I appreciate being on the show today. Thanks for being on the show with me, Cam. It's always great having you. And uh, thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This has been episode 22. Um, we hope you enjoyed. And if you did, please go rate and review us on iTunes. And uh, tune in next week where we'll be talking about Haskell once again. Who knows what, though? Yeah. And, you know, obviously this is uh, sponsored by IT Pro TV. So uh, any of your sysadmins or, you know, networking geeks need uh, any training, please have them check out ITPro.TV. Uh, we'd love to, to get you on board and help you out with um, all of our engaging content uh, by various IT platforms. So we're quite excited um, and we're definitely going to miss you guys. But we'll be back next week. See you then.